Hello, everyone. We made it. We are on our 50th club webinar. Whoop, whoop. We should have a celebration or something. I keep saying when we hit 50, we should have a party. So we are going to party like it's 1999. And if you guys remember that, that's when it was Y2K and everybody went nuts, right? So it's uh, thinking back to 1999, uh, except for now it's the coronavirus. Woo! <laughs> So you can remember that. Uh, if you're joining us for the first time, it's a club webinar for CCO. And what we do in our club webinars is that uh, the club members ask us questions and then we create a webinar through that, do the research and talk about the different questions that have come in. If you're interested in the CCO club that we have, it's really easy to find at cco.us forward slash club and here's a little more information about it. oh nope that's the wrong one we're going to talk about the coronavirus uh, again we did a webinar last week in our public webinar and that's what we talked about we we uh, if you're in the club you can go back and uh, look at all the different subjects we had six subjects all surrounding coronavirus and um, COVID-19 the new code that came out for it and that is U07.1 uh, we'll talk about that a little bit tonight but we got bombarded with questions again though we wanted to uh, have some coding scenarios that uh, we could use those uh, codes that we talked about. So we're going to practice a little bit. And in the meantime, if you need CEUs, if you need um, webinar support, if you want to see these webinars again and again and again and get the slide decks, then you, of course, you want to be part of the club. That's cco.us forward slash club. Uh, all kinds of questions, not just coding, but billing, practice management, compliance, uh, just uh, terminology. We, we have courses, we have pharmacology course even. And while you're sequestered at home, what a better time than to learn something new, right? Maybe pharmacology would be a great course to take or brush up your medical terminology and anatomy. You can find out more about all that stuff on the club though. So let's talk about COVID-19. That is the official name that was given. So we've been talking about coronavirus, uh, coronavirus uh, in Nova coronavirus. And what happens is the CDC and WHO uh, kind of get together and come up with a name that uh, they're gonna use. Uh, now we talked about this in our public webinar last Thursday. And again, club members go in, take a look at that. Uh, this is a little excerpt from that. Uh, one of the things that you may have seen is the SARS-CoV-2 virus. Well, remember when SARS came out? It was back in 2003. It was SARS-CoV for SARS coronavirus, and it was a respiratory virus. So the reason it's called SARS, or you've heard of SARS, it just means severe acute respiratory syndrome. And then it's the coronavirus, which a coronavirus is, is like a specific type of multivirus. And it, so instead of SARS-CoV, it's now SARS-CoV-2, like times two. It SARS came back, and now they're calling it uh, COVID-19, coronavirus COVID-19, which is from the SARS-CoV-2 virus. They are actually two separate viruses, but it comes from that. It's just nomenclature, more or less, how we identify it. You guys may be aware this is a flu. It's the flu. However, there's a lot of different kinds of flus. You've heard of the N1, um, uh, H1N1. You, uh, you've probably heard of bird flu and swine flu. My One of my daughters got swine flu. She was absolutely miserable for two weeks. Um, and they did a, a nasal swab to identify it. Nobody else in the house got it. So, you know. That being said, that tells you something about that flu, right? 
the it was contagious, but nobody else had it. And that was um, eight people in a house <laughs> together. Now, uh, unlike that swine flu that she had, the COVID-19 is very di different because it is very contagious. Um, also, some flus are respiratory flus. Some flus are affect the digestive tract. I know you guys are uh, probably experienced that. We know that when people go and get the flu shot every year, there's usually three strands or strains of flu that they put in that. And they, they project which were going to be the three worst, and that's the one they put out that year. So just because you've gotten the flu shot doesn't mean you won't get the flu. You're just not going to get the one you were vaccinated for. But the good news is once you're vaccinated, you, you don't get that one again. So if you get your flu shot every year, first year you're vaccinated for th with three strands or strains, and the next year it's three different ones. And the next year it's three different ones. And, you know, so in three years you're vaccinated against nine different flus. They are working rapidly on a vaccination for COVID-19. Uh, uh, the, and they're fast tracking it. So that means that they're not making them wait two or three years or, or more for clinical testing and everything. Um, this one is a new virus and it's been a relatively unpredictable because it was new. They don't know the, um, uh, the results, how it's going to affect people. They know it's respiratory, but they don't know, you know, they say two to 14 days. Uh, now we've got more information about people that are asymptomatic that are, you know, they've got it, but they're asymptomatic. So that they don't know it and they're passing it. So that's why it's, it's spread so rapidly. And if you're asymptomatic, and you spread it to somebody that has comorbidities, you know, uh, diabetes, COPD, emphysema, uh, any type of, of asthma, uh, autoimmune disorders like rheumatoid arthritis, or um, well, you you know all the you, those type of uh, disorders. But anybody that has cancer, um, again, how many, it seems like you everybody you talk to knows somebody that has cancer or has had cancer. So their immune system is depressed. And we don't want people to be in contact with this. And that's why everybody's been told to go home and stay there because you're spreading it. You may not be sick. All of that being said, it's important to know that COVID-19 is the official name and it has been given a code. Now, the reason I put in small print here is because I couldn't fit it on the slide with the picture. I'm going to show you what the COVID-19 looks like under a, an electron microscope. When I first in high school start, studied this stuff in uh, biology and in chemistry and, uh, and how chemistry and biology work together, uh, I was very, very interested in um, this type of stuff, uh, looking at stuff in the microscope and studying the cellular structures and, and everything. And I almost went, took my career that way, but actually I decided it was boring. So I do really enjoy understanding things on the cellular level, but it doesn't trip my trigger as much as the disease process itself, that one. So that's the information about uh, the picture that I'm going to show you. What about and diabetics? Uh, I know they are told to stay at home yes. as well. Absolutely. Diabetes, a uh, really good point because diabetes is one of the, um, diabetes affects every organ system in the body. And so that includes the respiratory system. But what we know about diabetes is when you have it, you don't heal as well as other people. So if you were to get a simple respiratory infection, it's going to be uh, harder on your body because your body's already stressed due to the diabetes and you don't heal as fast. Uh, so the medications aren't going to react to you as quickly or efficiently as it would with other people, possibility, but your body is already strained. So absolutely, diabetics need to be careful. Um, and it, 
diabetes does affect the lungs, but it affects you on the cellular level. <laughs> um, and anything that you're exposing your body to when you have diabetes, it, it can be um, harder on you. And honestly, now this is my personal opinion, uh, type one diabetes would be worse than type two. But 90, like 98% of all people are type two diabetics. But think of the other comorbidities that you usually have when you have diabetes. If you've had it for a while, then um, again, your circulatory system is compromised. And how does your body fight off viruses through the lymphatic and circulatory system? That's how the white blood cells get through. Uh, even your digestive system has chemicals in it that um, allow uh, the, uh, uh, so on the cellular level things to go in and out of uh, the membranes and it, that's it's all compromised so absolutely uh, I have a son as you guys know I talk about all the time that has rheumatoid arthritis which you don't think of it uh, arthritis as being something to worry about with this type of thing but rheumatoid arthritis is an autoimmune disorder so we're not letting him out of the house and and um, uh, you know he's a healthy 18 year old kid but um quite honestly he doesn't get out of the house much <laughs> anyway he's he's kind of a he's an introvert and a nerd so um i think his immune system not only is it suppressed he probably hasn't been too exposed in, a, in several years to some good germs either um i have asthma and so even though it's under control and it's been under control for about four or five years now under good control um, i have asthma and so I have uh, my respiratory system is compromised and that that means I'm not going out and licking doorknobs or anything else you know uh, everybody else in the house is fine but um, you, know, you have to think about that if you go out to the ATM to pull cash did you pick up germs on the ATM and then you come home and um, you touch your face or you touch your child's face you know, you just may, you've just given them exposure. So yes, diabetes. If you have any chronic condition, actually, uh, I would consider yourself compromised. And so, uh, better to be safe than sorry. We're going to talk a little bit about coronavirus being a viral disease. When we have uh, a lot of diseases in the disease process, they divide it up. Is it a bacterial or is it viral? Because we have antibiotics to fight bacterial infections. Now, some of them are kind of immune now, but the fact is good old penicillin, we've got different antibiotics. And so if it's bacterial, we've, you know, we're one step ahead. We can fight the infection. If it's viral, nothing fights viruses we we have that's why the common cold there is no cure for the common cold now you can absolutely treat the signs and symptoms but it's not like having a bacterial infection where you take an antibiotic and it goes to the source and eats up the the bacteria viruses don't look they don't work the same and viruses and bacteria literally from the cellular structure uh, uh, level look different. Now, I've got pictures of the virus and I didn't pull any bacteria, but you can do that on your own. Homework, right? You've got nothing else to do right now. You're at home. After this webinar, go look at bacterial cells, you know, and virus cells. Uh, the other thing is that COVID-19, we already mentioned that it is transmitted uh, through droplets in the respiratory system. And the areas that you want to avoid how it gets into the body is eyes, nose, and mouth. Okay, so right before we came on, my nose started itching for some reason. And here I am rubbing my nose and scratching it and, and everything. So again, if I've touched something or uh, been out in public and then you touch your face, you've just given yourself the opportunity to uh, be exposed. And you may, uh, you could actually get the virus and your body fights it. And uh, 
and yet you have it and you could be asymptomatic and then you could pass it to everybody else in the house uh, just talking to somebody that's why we're telling people the cdc is telling people you know you need to you need to stay away from people if you've got to go somewhere don't get up close because that droplet if you've ever watched i think they're called the slow-mo guys uh, they're on youtube but uh, they do they do video in slow motion and one of them was you know people talking and how much spray comes out of your mouth just talking uh, and of course they did sneezing and and the the perimeter and how far it went out was uh you know you don't see it but when you slow it down and magnify it it was pretty epic so again water droplets through the respiratory symptoms and we know that now the signs and symptoms are going to be a fever dry cough and shortness of breath just because you may not have those signs and symptoms doesn't mean you're not contagious if you test positive. Uh, they, you know, and if you've got it and you aren't sick enough to be put in the hospital, meaning you're having uh, respiratory issues, then you stay home with it just and you treat it just like you got the flu. And, you know, you go to bed, you drink your chicken noodle soup and you, uh, stay home. Now, how do they confirm the cases? It's actually a nasal swab. And we're not talking about a simple, you know, tick, stick a Q-tip up your nose. No. <laughs> I see all these people rushing out to get, you know, tested. And I think to myself, I realize because it is a swab it's a little bit bigger than a q you know the the swab part is bigger than a q-tip and um it's quite long for a purpose and this is an old crochet hook but they are going to stick that up your nose but they aren't going to just stop there they want to hit go back in as far as they can so it's like they're going to the back of your throat through your nose so they're going to stick that thing in there rub it around they want to get to the back the nasal pharynx area so in through the nose just as far back as they can get and rub it around not a pleasant experience my daughter who you know tested positive for the swine flu that's how they tested and she said it was horrible <laughs> but um, again your results are not instant so it's not like going in and uh, you have a UTI and they have you pee in a cup and they do a little dipstick and look and they say oh yes you know there's white blood it tested positive for white blood cells or you know xyz no they're gonna package that up get all your information seal it up and they got to send it off and it takes several days to get a confirmation so let's say that you're positive you know so you went it and through the drive-through however they've got that set up they swab you they get it all taken care of and you know, you probably didn't go alone, right? Uh, so you you get information back several days later and um, you didn't stay home because you felt fine, but you wanted to go get tested anyway. Uh, and you just exposed everybody that you were in contact with if you were positive. And you may not show the signs and symptoms two to 14 days. Now we do know that they're saying that you are contagious when you have a fever, but how many of you have experienced experienced having a low grade and it just kind of wears you out and then if you go ahead and get sick you know get sicker and it it spikes well <laughs> if you've got a low grade fever you've got a fever and you're spreading it you know uh, some people have tested positive and only had a fever and didn't feel very good you know but they didn't feel like they really had the flu um, but they were they were exposed their spouse had it and, and got really sick. So yeah, lucky them they didn't get a sick. However, you are contagious. How do we treat it? Well, they can give you, there is antiviral medications out there, but it doesn't work. It is not a cure. It For the most part, we're treating the signs and symptoms. And that's why the drug that everybody's talking about now that they're hopeful with is uh, that malaria drug. It, because when you get malaria, you don't ever get 
rid of malaria. Uh, once you've got it, you've got it. You just um, go, you have flares with it. And so you could have a really bad flare. You get very, very ill. Um, you recover. And five years later, you could break out with another um, uh, spell of it, however you want to have another flare of it. Uh, but there are medications that help kind of subdue that. And these these are looking hopeful to help suppress the COVID-19. It's not going to cure it, but again, they, they're hoping um, to come up with some type of a vaccine. But then again, there really is not a vaccine for a coronavirus. Um, so we're, we're trying to build up an immune system. And, you know, when I talk about all this stuff, you know, my nose tickles. Uh, how many of you guys are touching your nose and eyes and mouth and trying not to? Mild cases, again, you stay at home. You you act as if you had the flu. And um, and hopefully it won't take 14 days to, to get over, but you're going to be sick for a while. Uh, a light case, hopefully, for you. Now, signs and symptoms help the breathing, um, suppress the cough, and treat the fever. And uh, we're hearing things about Tylenol working better, so... Uh, another chemical thing um, uh, to understand. So this is what it looks like. And this is attributed to, uh, I put in the resources page at the very end of the slide deck, the links so that you can turn around and, and go look at these if you are uh, and read the articles and the um, um, medical journals that I pulled this stuff from. However, if you're not in the club, you really don't have access to <laughs> but if you're in the club, you can go get those links and actually click on them. Uh, with this, you're just going to be able to look at them. So if you look at this image and it's stained, uh, uh, this is, you know, what do you think the coronavirus is? When you look at this, what images are you seeing that is the coronavirus? So put in the Put in the chat, put in the question. I'm curious, um, you know, and even talk amongst yourself what you're thinking. I'll give you a minute to do that while I get a little sippy sippy here, but you may be surprised. So what do you think in this image is the coronavirus? Okay, you've had your time. It's actually the blue circles. So the lighter baby blue circles that you're seeing, and if you could actually get in and look at this even closer, when I show you in some of the following slides what the virus looks like, then you're going to say, oh, okay, I see it. But these type of viruses, coronaviruses, are little circles with little uh, tags off of them. And those little fingers, appendages, they actually are what grabs onto things and holds on the virus. Bacteria, unlike that, don't really have those little fingers to grab, those little little hairs to grab onto things. They move around. They, like, some have a tail, but they're definitely uh, different shapes, okay? But uh, uh, this, these, all these viruses usually circles, and then they have these little, little uh, appendages, and those little appendages grow, you know, grab things, and then they start, um, filtering in through the cells, okay? And there's lots of really cool pictures of all of this. And then I was going to save them. And I thought, you know what? No, nah, we're, we're, we're going to be talking about uh, some of the scenarios and the cases and, and things. So I need to not get sidetracked. But I was really reliving my youth going through those. So the little blue cells, the little blue circles are actually the, the virus, the COVID-19. The black, the little black uh things that you're seeing, those black dots, that's actually a part of it too, but they they said in the description it's a, it's a slice, uh, a different slice, a different way. So again, that is a really cool picture. Looks like an alien image or something. Now, this is the SARS-CoV, uh, or uh, CoV and SARS-CoV-2. So this is what NOVA or COVID-19 looks like. That's those little spike uh, glycoproteins uh, uh, or whatever. And uh, the, so they're the little fingers and all of these little parts 
uh, inside there. It's really neat to see what they actually look like in the studies and stuff. So that's what that virus looks like. Now look over here. This is what the hepatitis virus looks like. They almost look exactly the same when you see them side by side. This is 2020. This is 2011. And notice that what this virus has that this one doesn't are these little blue uh, additional fingers out there and it's a uh, hemagglutinin uh, estrese dimer or he so the again the little appendages look a little bit different but it's the same thing it's got those little fingers so it has the same components and makeup because it's a virus and yet uh the when they are trying to get rid of a virus or find something to help prevent it, what they're trying to do on a cellular level is make something in this virus not work. So for hepatitis, uh, maybe they'll find a chemical or a way to knock these little blue things off. So then it only has the yellow, okay? Or we figure out a way that when it replicates itself, it only makes half of the little yellow, these little yellow appendages that it does before. And eventually it can't make those, so uh, it can't grab a hold and, and infect the body. Or let's say these little inner parts here, this nucleoprotein, it breaks them down and misshapes them like, like a cancer cell and it uh, uh, invades and eats these. Again, you're, you're damaging uh, the virus on a cellular level and so therefore it kills itself off ultimately uh, or uh, uh, as it replicates itself so again that's how they look for antiviral type stuff but I wanted to give you a look as to uh, a drawing of what it would look like I thought that would be interesting for you this is also uh, the uh, th this is the COVID-19 the SARS CoV-2 virus and it's an electron microscope and then it's showing you those the little arrows are those little appendages and how they're touching each other there's the little nucleus right so again I know I got sidetracked I really love this type of thing but that's what it looks like those little blue circles you blow those up even more and that's what you get to see All right see this little squiggle right here that little squiggle means something but we're not going to get sidetracked anymore. Now, let's do what we came here to do tonight, and let's talk about some of the scenarios, okay, that could happen. And um, my husband this afternoon came in and told me, he said, hey, the president just announced that, you know, kind of the epicenter for the U.S. is in New York, and that he was spouting off the different, telling me and some of it I remembered but uh you know like 30 percent of all New Yorkers now have tested positive for some I, and again don't quote me I'm trying to remember what he said but that impressed me and the fact that he said that they said if you had been in New York this past you know a week ago uh then you need to make sure you stay at home sequester don't go out because you, you've probably been I mean you're pretty confident you've been exposed then and therefore wherever you went you're exposing more people and this is how it spreads and if you look at the curve of, of the spread we were doing pretty good so when we did our first COVID uh, presentation the other day uh, we looked up on this the this like CDC website eight cases in the United States that day and it hasn't even been two weeks, and now we're into multiple, you know, we're what we're, we're almost at ten thousand, I think. I can't remember, uh, eight eight thousand something cases as of today. So again, it spreads very very quickly. Eight to almost ten thousand in two weeks, and it's and so we're going to start seeing that curve going up higher, and that's why they keep talking about that curve. We want to cut that curve off right so that the cases aren't going up it's going to level out because right now it's a straight peak you know you guys have you ever uh watched um oh the little the mountain game on uh the price is right and the little 
little uh, mountain guy do 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 and he's, he goes up for however many dollars you were off and you know when he goes up to the mountain then he falls off right no we want him to go up and stop then you want your prize right if it's in the little area no you want it to not fall off <laughs> we want it to steady out or stop the growth right so the scenario I thought of, I added this after he told me that. Uh, so we got a date. Uh, I put today's date, uh, Mrs. Twinkleweather. And of course, we have to have a good name because this is relatively, most people are getting depressed about all of this and not used to staying home. And, and they might have enjoyed if it, if it was a vacation. But when you're told to stay home, it makes you feel bad. So Mrs. Tingleweather, I love that, uh, a 67-year-old established patient cut her vacation short in New York. While there, she attended two Broadway shows. After hearing the president on TV state that people in New York in the past week need to shelter in place due to high exposure possibility, she called her PCP to ask what she should do. She had no signs and symptoms other than feeling tired, which she attributed to her traveling. She flew from New York to Dallas, because Dallas is a hub, and then uh, from Dallas to Austin, which is like a puddle flight, because that's where she lives. All right. So all of this tells you quite a bit, right? Um, uh, the fact that she's over 65, okay? Uh, she's active. She went you know, she's healthy enough to fly out to Broadway and, and watch a couple shows and, and she uh, was going to spend more time in New York, but, um, you know, came back. Uh, she was feeling fine, but she heard that on the news. So she thought, hey, I was in New York when they said I better call my doctor. What do I need to look for? Because after all, she's 67. Now, it doesn't talk about any other comorbidities, but I can guarantee you there's a protocol in place. So you call your doctor and different places are going to have different product calls, but um, they're going to say, you know, were you exposed? Well, if you were in New York, they're saying, yeah, anybody come now before they were saying, have you been to China recently? You know, have you been overseas? Have you been in an airport? Things like that. Now in the U.S., have you been in uh, New York, Washington or California? <laughs> have you flown? Uh, because then you're exposed to people that have been there, but that's the hot spots as of right now. And it's growing rapidly. Uh, do you live in a city? You know, in other words, do you have more opportunity to be exposed to multiple people? Uh, what's your job? Is that a type that, you know, a uh, cashier at the, the grocery store is going to get a whole lot more exposure than a person that, you know, um, uh, works remote like I do, or even think of like a librarian, <laughs> you know, they're touching everything. Now, that all being said, again, what do we have? High exposure possibility. What's your signs and symptoms? None, really, except for tired. Okay, that's plausible, right? But you've been on an airplane and you've been exposed. So what do we have? If um, you go in, they have encounter for observation of suspected exposure to other biological agents it's a z03818 that's the code that you need to be aware of now it is important to also know that all z03 codes are people that uh, are suspected there's abnormal conditions there's no diagnosis here we're just saying hey abnormal condition or signs and symptoms and we need to pay attention heads up we need to observe this patient okay again the this is the code that uh is for possible exposure right z03818 then what's going to happen so tomorrow mrs tinkleweather is the office uh, to actually get the COVID-19 test. So again, they said, hey, don't come in today, come in tomorrow, get the COVID-19 test, and let's find out. Again, protocol will establish what do we need to know. She has no fever, she has no cough, and she's not short of breath. She's still feeling rather run down, okay? Uh, so again, she's 67 years old, and she's all upset and worried and she just you know uh, had to make travel plans cut her you know her 
her travel short and all this going on, of course, she's probably tired and stressed. So again, that still is explainable, uh, but attests that she still thinks it's due to the trip and that flying has always worn her out. And I don't know about you guys, but if I fly, my ankles and hands swell up something fierce. She's going to stay at home. She's going to notify the doctor's office if she has any further signs or symptoms. Now, she also states, but what about Mr. Tinkleweather? He didn't go to New York and he feels fine because, again, protocol would be the doctor's going to ask who else is in the household with you and how do they feel? Because we know you can have asymptomatic transmission is what they're they're saying now. So he's fine. Everything's fine. Uh, then the following day, uh, 326, call to Mrs. Tinkleweather uh, at 915 a.m. Now, mind you, these these tests don't take they, they take more than a couple days. I can't remember off the top of my head. I should have looked it up for you, but again, it's it could be four to six days before you get the results. Uh, it's not an instant test. So Mrs. Tinkleweather, this is the, the clinic calling her, her doctor's office said, called at 9.50 a.m. AM with notification of a positive COVID-19 results. She's positive. She's asymptomatic, but she's positive. And that means that did she get it in New York? Did she get it on the airport? Did she get it in Dallas? Did she get it in Austin? You know, did she have it before she left? You know, uh, again, we don't know. So they'll create a timeline and a protocol will be put into place. You know, now we have to notify everybody that you've been exposed to. We have to start tracking that. Then um, also education for the patient and caregivers or family members. Uh, what the, again, reiterate, these are the signs and symptoms and that you should stay at home. Don't expose anybody else. And that means that everybody in the family now has to stay at home. Well, it's good to know Mr. and Mrs. Tinkleweather do not have any children living at home uh, at this time. That's a good thing because I would hate to be 67 years old and have my children still living at home with me in my basement or whatever. <laughs> okay, so stay at home. The protocol gets implemented. And again, different places will have different protocols, but that's going to be important if you are part of the clinic system. We need to know what they are. Um, and then uh, let's see, Mr. Tinkle Weather, uh, he has now been exposed to a confirmed case, not like her to begin with, possible exposure. It's confirmed. She has it. And uh, so they ask about him and ask, does he need to come in and be tested? Uh, he's been cranky, but he, she doesn't think he's sick. She continued to feel uh, tired, but uh, they will go and check their temperatures and they'll check his temperature and get back with them. So Mr. Tinkleweather has no signs and symptoms. The code changes. He has now, he's now, um, uh, if he's gonna come in and get tested, he's a Z. 20.828 contact with and suspected exposure to other viral communicable diseases, which is a viral COVID 19 is. And this is also the same code that you're going to have when your provider writes things like suspected, possible, probable. Okay. Do not use B97.29, which is the code that you would use for. Uh, the, the COVID virus until April 1st because that's when new um, uh, U07.1 gets launched, okay? So uh, we have uh, signs and symptoms, but you got Z20.828. Now let me look at some of the questions that are being populated over here real quick so I can address those. I saw them in the corner of my eye. Alicia, I put um, them in a big paragraph first. So just go down a little bit and you'll see them split up. If it's, you can't read them. At the top oh, there. good. Okay. Let's see if that is, that's the big one. And I got the little window. Yeah, start smallish. with Win Whitney there. Whit Whitney. Okay. Since I code hospitalists, I cannot begin to tell you how many patients I have seen with either suspected 
or confirmed cases in the last two days. Absolutely. You because that's going to where they're going to go. And especially if um, they have comorbidity. So if they've got a fever, if someone has a fever and they think they've been exposed, uh, they're going to go to the hospital. If they have shortness of breath, they're going to go to the hospital. And if they're, for example, a COPD patient, they're probably going to admit them they're going to test them, but the test doesn't come back right away. It doesn't matter that you're in a hospital. The test just does not come back fast. Now, a new one has come out, and I, I think it's like a day, 24 hours. Uh, again, you may already know, so let us know in the chat so that you can tell everybody and inform everybody. If you're in the club, make sure you post. Um, you can also put a link in there with more information. I did not um, take the time to talk about the, or go research the new test. Uh, all that information is out there anyway, and we're, we're good researchers, us coders. So this uh, Z20.828 is going to be a given on so many encounters because the person could just have regular flu. The whole time that we're doing the COVID-19, the, it's the flu season. All those regular flus are out there too. You know, so uh, unless you test positive, you do not have COVID-19. Okay. Uh, very good point, Whitney. Uh, let's see. And then Shirley says, somebody just sent me a message on Facebook Messenger saying you should wash your hands every 20 minutes. You, <laughs> have you guys heard this too? Is this really true? Just wondering. I would say no. <laughs> First of all, you're going to have dishpan hands. Um, you know, if you're if you're out there working in the public, for some reason you're not able to, uh, you know, put a mask on or gloves or, or whatever, you know, fine. But I think that's a little excessive. Every 20 minutes, how are you going to even function? To, how are you going to get anything done if you're washing your hands that often? Um, I would I would say that's overkill. Uh, and you have to be very, very careful whenever you have any type of an event. The the media and the social medias are going to pummel you with information. And if you don't go to the source, which would be who World Health Organization website or the CDC or CMS.gov, I would I would trust them too. Uh, then don't trust anybody else. And again, that's why in all this information I'm giving you, we've got the resources so that you can, you go look at what I say, but don't believe what I say. You go look for yourself. So how could somebody live with washing their hands every 20 minutes? You got to wash your hands for two minutes anyway. So that's, you know, uh, a lot of time out of your life. No, that's not going to, that doesn't seem likely. Uh, besides, if you are at home, and you're not touching your face and, you know, and stuff, great. You know, you're okay. And if um, if you're out in public, then you should. Uh, every time you leave your house and you, you know, I live in a rural area, I'm okay. It's just me and the chickens, uh, you know, with the family. But if you, if I have to go into town for anything, like I said, go to the gas station uh, to put car, go pull cash out for whatever reason. The pizza guy comes. You know what? If the pizza guy comes, you better wash everything, uh, wash again. After you, you hand him money from the ATM, he picks it up. He breathes on you, you know, whatever. Wash your hands when somebody comes to the house. Somebody delivered us a little care package the other day. So we wiped everything down, which I know they already wiped everything down. And then everybody went and washed their hands. And um, uh, again, some other things that we think outside of the box. Um, I did go to the CDC website with uh, all the different viruses and what is uh, positive to kill the virus. Several of the viruses were killed by hydrogen peroxide. Ammonia killed almost everything. Uh, bleach, of course, the different uh, bleach, as well as, um, let's see, alcohol, bleach, ammonia, and hydrogen peroxide. Well, you can get a big giant bottle of hydrogen peroxide for 50 cents at the Dollar General, you know, so 
put that in a bottle with some rubbing alcohol and um, if you don't have any bleach and uh, peroxide is pretty safe you can spray that on everything uh, in fact I think that is uh, what that spray is. you remember they used to anywhere spray in the white bottle and they would show you spraying all your kids clothes and stuff like that I think it was like a type of hydrogen peroxide so again spray your hands down and everything and uh, uh, but don't don't give yourself horrible dishpan hands 20 minutes check the resources uh let's see everybody likes to spread pandemic fear because that's gets everybody all excited nobody ever listens to the good news <laughs> um the life of tree the life of tree nine two five one one is the code for checking for the virus well okay so that's the cpt code uh, i don't have the uh my find a code up but uh good to know okay uh let's see also gabby lynn said question to people out there does anyone know about the codes for telemedicine if the patient can call the doctor before they go okay when we had our um yeah there's a lot of great information and content on telemedicine uh and they're actually approving some changes to make it easier in telemedicine but last Thursday we did the public webinar and Jennifer talked in um, uh, in detail about tele telemedicine so if you're on the um, if you're in our club you have access to that and she also talked about uh, Medicare and billing so the codes for telemedicine the billing for telemedicine uh, all of those and the different insurances that was all talked about so you can um, look at that uh, and uh, we're going to try to see if Jennifer can also have a webinar maybe um, the next webinar we do uh, Thursday maybe maybe or not I don't know uh, have her do a student webinar and and talk about the billing aspects where can I find these types of pictures of the virus the little blue dots uh, that is um, again I'll show you the website at the end and the resource page but uh, you got to be very careful when you do Google images because there's certain images that even though they're on Google does not mean they're free to use okay but uh, uh, I would get on Google image and I would type in um, electron microscope or microscope um, uh, COVID-19 those are your keywords don't do COVID-19 by itself you need to say that it's microscopic or or electron microscope uh, and there's lots of articles that have used that the the picture that I picked up and but I I went to the source and got it from there so you can see that Brenda for telehealth can a uh, nurse practitioner video and does the doctor have to be there um, there is a protocol for that I do believe that a nurse practitioner can do that all of the information is given to the provider he signs off on everything but uh, again that was talked about Thursday from Jennifer so go to the club if you're not a member of the club it's really easy again just go to ccdo.us forward slash club um, let's see the live tree again how much work does the billing specialist have right now in the hospital uh, with multiple coronaviruses patients they are super busy right now and um, not only are the coders but the billers but they've been sent home uh, I was talking to a supervisor uh, for Baylor Scott and Y in the coding department and she said that um, she'd gone to the ID department and they were having a meeting because they would just gotten uh, a request for a hundred computers uh, this these uh, coders and so and, and work they wanted them ASAP so, so uh, again, I don't know what they're gonna you, do with all those computers for, afterwards you broke up for a second just oh, back up the, a couple sentences the the supervisor had let me know that she'd been in the ID part ID department IT department and that um, they had been in a meeting because uh, their request had come in for a hundred laptops 
so that their employees could go work from home. And that was billers and coders and, and stuff. So again, this so not only do you have the hospital cultures, but you got the you you got the clinic stuff. And so that was Blader Scott and White. And if you're in Texas, you know, Baylor Scott and White's everywhere. So uh, that was really cool. Do you have uh, do you have the codes for the signs and symptoms? I sure do. I got those coming up next. Thanks for asking. Uh, okay, so Mr. Uh, Tinkleweather, he's just cranky. Chances are he's sick, but we don't know. But if his wife has it confirmed, then chances are, because we know this is a very aggressive um, uh, virus. Z20.828, definitely a code that you want to know. Now, let's talk about uh, on the 30th, uh, Mrs. Tinkleweather is seen with an acute uh, bronchitis due to COVID-19, low-grade fever, cough, and some mild S, uh, shortness of breath. Okay, so we're not going to code the signs and symptoms. We know those are the signs and symptoms for COVID-19. And I've got those, I've got those codes for you guys too. Uh, but we have an acute bronchitis and we need to code that. So that's J20.8. And then what is the organism? It's B97.29 because until April 1st, we don't have a code for COVID. But as of after April 1st, we'll have U07.1. Now, does that mean U07.1 will be able to go back and code? Uh, use that for visits and stuff that were before that. Yes, you will. They're retro. They're retrograding it back. However, your system is not going to accept it because it won't recognize it as a code. And uh, uh, that's why I added the CDC information. Uh, notice that it's announcing a change in the effective date of new diagnosis code U07.1 COVID-19 from October 1st, 2020 to April 1st, 2020. Okay, so they're implementing it, but this this alone, the fact that they created a code uh, for COVID-19, and I think the only reason they were allowed to, they were able to do that was because of it being a pandemic. It's not an epidemic, a pandemic. And if you don't know the difference, there's plenty of education out there, the difference between a pandemic and epidemic. But, um, and so they've got to track it. We need to track it. How do we track it? We have to have a code. And you can't use B97.29 to track COVID because it's used for other, everything that's an other. And other in this scenario just means it's identified. We just don't have a code for it yet. So now they've, they've identified it. And so B97.29 would be the organism. And as of April 1st, we'll be able to use U07.1. Sure, there are some memes coming out there with U07.1. Signs and symptoms. Here you go. If the signs and symptoms are going to be coded, R05 for the cough, R06.02 for the shortness of breath, fever unspecified would be R50.9. Whenever we don't have a definitive diagnosis, we're going to code the signs and symptoms. And there's your codes for you. However, if you are working as an inpatient, you're going to code the signs and symptoms too. So even though they've got COVID and whatever else they've got, you're going to be coding those signs and symptoms along the way uh, because they track them. And those, uh, those R codes do not carry a risk score for HCCs, for risk adjustment. However, <laughs> some of these others uh, do, like ARDS, definitely will risk adjust. Now, will U07.1 risk adjust? Uh, if it was anything other than a pandemic code, I would say no. But with it being a pandemic then and, and costing a lot of money, I suspect that it is, they're gonna do something to make it risk adjust, but otherwise uh, it doesn't, okay? So definitively saying no, however, is that, for uh, the risk adjustment coders out there who are thinking, wow, this is costing a lot of money and we need to know, and is there long-term effects of it? Yeah, there, we might see, maybe it's gonna be an RxHCC, I don't know. 
but we'll find out. So this is a, a graph that a table a table that I used for that uh, public webinar last Thursday. And uh, we're going to talk about it a little, little more in depth. We're going to break it down. Uh, uh, do know that the reason we're using the B97.29 code is because that is the code for COVID right now until April 1st. And it's a code that states other, you know, other uh, viral. And after the uh, April 1st, then we'll use that will be replaced with a U07.1. So don't get confused if in the next few weeks it's April and we're not going to be using B97.29. So if you're in the club and you're referencing back to this, okay. But this are the diagnoses that came out with the CDC as a heads up on the codes that you're going to be using. So the CDC is saying this is the verbiage. This is what you would code in those scenarios. Now we're going to look. We're going to look at these a little more um, in depth. So let's start with. Uh, now oh, let me go back real quick. We already coded for possible exposure Z03.818 because Mrs. Tinkleweather had that, and then um, uh, Mr. Tinkleweather was actually exposed. Z two zero point eight two eight. So we're not going to we're not going to use those. Okay, we we know those now. And our scenarios: if we look at acute bronchitis due to other specified organisms. So Mrs. Tinkleweather was diagnosed with acute bronchitis. J uh, two zero point eight. Now we know that she had. She has po tested positive for coronavirus, so you could use the B code. But if it was April 1st, then she would be the J20.8, and then she would uh, have additional code for the U07.1. Uh, right now, let's talk about what acute bronchitis is. I thought I'd just give you a little more information. This comes straight from Find a Code, they are wonderful to give us all this additional information and I've given you the link to them at the end. Uh, we kind of partner with them. We um, use them in a lot of our lectures and you'll see uh, when you look up their codes are BAT technique implemented in, in the CPT codes. So with most uh, types of acute bronchitis, then uh, it, it comes on quickly, boom. You're sick right away, and it can last three to 10 days most of the time. Now, we know with uh, the COVID-19, they're, they're talking about 14 days, two weeks that you could be sick. Uh, the acute bronchitis can be brought on by bacteria, uh, viral, other, and um, unspecified. So those are the things that you need to know about them with the organism. But there is also under viral, see the other types of um, things that can give the bronchitis, these viruses. The first one I can't um, pronounce, but the other one's parainfluenza virus, respiratory cynical virus, or RSV. That's what little kids, you remember the little babies that get RSV and have to be put in the hospital? and monitored rhinovirus and echovirus. Those are all uh, ones that you may have been familiar with. And now we've got coronavirus. We've had coronaviruses. Uh, coronaviruses have been around forever. Uh, however, we identify specific coronaviruses like SARS, MERS, and now COVID-19. All right. So what if we have an acute lower respiratory infection okay now do not confuse acute bronchitis with a lower respiratory infection uh, this is going to be coded j22 if it's they know that it's due to sars excuse me not the covid 19 then again b97.29 or depending on your time frame the u07.2 one, uh, I did note here straight from find a code, the excludes one. Lower respiratory infection is different than 
upper respiratory infection. So pay attention to those little details. Is it an upper or is it a lower respiratory infection? Okay. And then again, if it is an upper respiratory infection and the doctor uh, says it's due to uh, COVID-19, then you would just use the J06.9. Follow those instructions. Now, we could also have other specified respiratory disorders. So again, the example they gave would be a lower respiratory infection, but it's not acute. Okay, so it's other respiratory disorders, meaning we don't have a code for it. Uh, J98.8, and then we would do our COVID-19 code. Then we have uh, acute respiratory distress syndrome, which is ARDS, J80. You don't want ARDS. This is not pneumonia. Uh, can pneumonia turn into ARDS? Yes, it can. So respiratory distress syndrome is the, the lungs are shutting down. It's, it's a respiratory distress. Pneumonia is when the lungs fill up with fluid or fill up with something. But ARDS uh, is stressing the lungs to the point you're not breathing. Uh, usually if you develop ARDS, you're in ICU and you're on a, some type of a breathing system. So J80 would be the code with the COVID code. And those are other terms that are, are also for ARDS. Now, we've already done the possible exposure to COVID and uh, the actual exposure with confirmed COVID. Okay. So let's now look at some more questions. I see a couple more came in. Ah, thank you. Okay. So according to WHO, China has, uh, let's see, 81,767 uh, cases. The U.S. has... 42,164. Why isn't China much higher seeing they started there? I've got an answer for you. The reason is because people have recovered. They've had it long enough that if you go and you look at how many people um, died from COVID-19, they're no longer counted. And how many people who have actually recovered from COVID-19? They're not counted in anyway. So their curve is coming down dramatically now. Okay. So if you'd looked at who two weeks ago, significantly different numbers. And um, so we're on, uh, um, China is on the downward curve of the disease. Italy is, is crusted and they're starting to come down. Uh, uh, and we are on the rise right now. So I would predict humbly that um, by this weekend, that uh, 42, you, you know, uh, number 42,000 uh, possibly could, could, could double. And that's why we don't want to happen. And that's why the president and um, your uh, governors and county levels, they're shutting everything down because China didn't do that. And Italy didn't do that. And that's why their numbers skyrocketed. But everybody's, we want our numbers to crest. And so, you know, hopefully with the precautions that we're taking, it will happen. Um, and we won't end up with like uh, China conditions and Italy's conditions where people are dying because we don't have the healthcare uh, provider and equipment to take care of uh, the people who are really, really sick. Okay, so that being said, then according to who China has, da, 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 okay, that's that's why. Uh, Whitney says, what is the correct way to code coronavirus with pneumonia, sepsis, and respiratory failure? Do you use the pneumonia due to coronavirus code? Would you code respiratory failure separately? Okay, let me go back and I will tell you. So I... I I'm not going to go in and pull the codes for those because I, I can't. Um, and so the pneumonia code, the J12.89, can a person have pneumonia? Ultimately, the, the question is, if we break down Whitney's question, is uh, can a person have pneumonia, sepsis, and respiratory failure all together? And the answer is yes. Okay. So 
why does the person have pneumonia? They got pneumonia due to COVID-19. So the COVID-19 code will stay with that, whichever one you have to use. And you will code the pneumonia. You will code the sepsis because um, uh, the sepsis is a uh, severe sepsis, we'll say came from the pneumonia. And uh, it means one of the organ systems is uh, shutting down and we're gonna say it's the lungs, of course, because we have respiratory failure and respiratory failure would be coded separate. So I would code all three of those separate because it's been an inpatient too. And you, you wouldn't have respiratory failure and the patient not be inpatient. And quite honestly, you, you drop every ICD code you can with an inpatient, signs and symptoms, everything, because that's how they get paid. So you get X amount of money for a fever, you get X amount of money for pneumonia, you get X amount of money for se sepsis, and you get another amount for respiratory failure. And so um, uh, what happens is the sequencing takes effect. <laughs> so which is going to be the most um, expensive to uh, treat? You want that to be your first listed diagnosis. So is it going to be pneumonia? No, it doesn't cost as much to uh, treat pneumonia as it does sepsis. And then respiratory or sepsis doesn't cost as much as it uh, to, to treat respiratory failure. So respiratory failure is your number one code, then sepsis, then pneumonia, then COVID, and 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 just go down from then. And um, that is uh, that's the important takeaway there. Do you code the dependence on a ventilator status code? Yes. When the patient is put on a ventilator? Yes. Yes, you do. Uh, it because uh, you, some people think, oh, well, that's just for people that have to be on a ventilator for a very long time. No. If the person can't breathe without the ventilator and they're going to be on, you know, their, their status is that they are at this point ventilated. If they have respiratory distress, they're ventilator dependent. So excellent question. That's really, really good. Anything else out there? Now, I encourage you guys, not only are you talking amongst yourselves in the social media, I see another one pop in, uh, that that we have, whether you're looking, you're watching from um LinkedIn, if you're watching in YouTube or Facebook, what if you're watching on YouTube and Facebook or, or LinkedIn, I would really encourage you to share the broadcasts that we do, because not only does that does this stuff free, uh, we get the word out there uh, and, and help educate people, but th that is the fact that it's free. Okay. Uh, uh, let's reiterate what we said before: is you know there's so much going out on social media. Make sure you fact check everything. You know, we try to do our research. We try to be very cautious about what we do. However, we all can make mistakes. Um, I transposed um, two numbers in this presentation, this this graph, um, last Thursday, and I caught it today. So uh, little mistakes can be made. Uh, let's see, witnesses. I have a patient came into the ER and wanted a, a COVID test due to her blood pressure being 140 over 80. She has no complaints, but they refused her test. And as they should have, <laughs> because high blood pressure is uh, not a sign and symptom of the um, COVID-19. Neither is malaise and fatigue. Especially if you can uh, attribute it uh, attribute it to something else, like Mrs. Tinkleweather, right? She'd traveled. She's 67 years old. Of course, she's going to be tired. It's going to take her a while to recover. She knows her body better than anybody else, and she's saying, "No, I don't feel sick. I'm just tired," uh, and I think that's what it is. Now, did she end up with COVID? Yes, she did. Did she end up with a fever? Yes, she did. And so uh, uh, malaise and fatigue is another symptom, but it is a symptom that usually comes after you've had you've got fever, shortness of breath and and the cough. So, uh, yeah, that uh, and besides 140 over 80, it's not a very high blood pressure, especially if they're an elder, you know, a little bit older. Um, if people go in and start getting tested without signs and symptoms, you cannot be, don't get upset. Don't tell people not to get upset if they refuse to test because they have a limited number of 
testing swabs and then remind them, hey, you know how we're going to test for that? We're going to shove a giant Q-tip through your nose, down your throat, and we're going to swizzle it around. You know, so uh, again, it's not comfortable. <laughs> if you have signs and symptoms and you've been exposed, don't go get a test. Just assume you have it and stay home and treat yourself as if you have the flu and let your family members know. Now, if, if, you start running a fever that's over 104, you have shortness of breath to the extent like you feel like you've walked up a flight of stairs or no, run up a flight of stairs and you can't catch your, you know, uh, uh, dipsy and you can't catch your breath. No, then you go in, you call the doctor and you let them know. And they're going to be able to hear that over the phone and they're going to triage you. If you have no other comorbidities and you're a very healthy patient like uh, the nurse, I think I talked about her that went to Hawaii, uh, she was a nurse. She knew. And the only reason she went in to the ER was because of the shortness of breath. She was really struggling to breathe. And she doesn't normally have that. And she knew the signs and symptoms of the COVID. So, you know, and then what did she do? She went home and she recovered at home right, with medication to help with the shortness of breath and the fever and so on and so forth. So again, if you think you're sick, stay home. If you got a cold, you know it's a cold. If you know it's hay fever, going to be that time, guys, it's spring. Uh, so that's fine. If you normally have allergies at this time of year, don't go get a COVID-19 test. Save it for people who are uh, have comorbidities, right? If you're an overall healthy person, you can call your doctor and let them know just so they can get you down. Say, yeah, I got these signs and symptoms. I think I was exposed. Okay. Uh, if you get worse, we're going to test you. Right. Why go in and expose yourself, even in that line <laughs> and in your car, if you don't have to? So healthy people, stay at home. If you get sick and even if you get COVID, stay at home. Only go in uh, if you're really, really ill and um uh, or you have comorbidities where you could go downhill really really quickly uh, so that they can start onboarding treatment because we need to save the healthcare providers uh exposure and we need to um also save the beds in the hospital the hospitals and the clinics are are overwhelmed especially if you live in a city so that all being said let's go wrap this up uh, here are the resources that I used and um, again go directly to the um, who and uh, it's just who.int so it's who international uh, and you're going to get tons of information and you can trust that information now it may be a little convoluted and hard to read but you, you know, uh, then come to us and we'll help you decipher it, ask a question. Uh, the other one um, are reputable sites because they're bookmarked from who, you know, so you can go and look at those uh, uh, to, to get more information. But social media is not where it's at. Don't, don't be getting information from them and thinking that it's facts. It's not. Yeah, I can tell you anything I wanted. <laughs> wash your hands every 20 minutes you know <laughs> uh, besides you know what the cure for uh, COVID-19 is I decided uh, let's see if I've got it here I don't think I do it's glitter I have a card uh, with glitter on it and I'm mailing them all out to my friends that's got glitter on it and that's the cure send somebody a card with glitter on it and they'll also remember not to touch the face. They'll have glitter all over their face. Thanks, guys, for joining us. Appreciate it. Uh, don't forget, like, share. Uh, let other people know about the CCO Club if you're already a member. If you're not a member and you're curious, it's real easy to get more information. Just go to the cco.us forward slash club. Um, it is everybody's talking about it and it's a great forum to get your questions answered we've got a lot of subject matter experts we have interns that do research uh, and um, again one great thing about coders it's a it's a brand of work where we all enjoy our work we're a happy lot especially risk adjustment coders I'll have to say and uh, research with good facts 
It's what we're all about. Thank you, Alicia. Everybody says very much that they appreciated your information here today. And uh, hopefully, just heads up, we'll, we'll our next uh, webinar, we'll see if we can't get Jennifer to talk more about the billing aspect because that is gonna be very, very important too. And I know some of you um, are looking for that information. Bye guys. Mm -hmm.